Well, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here with Nathan Newdorf, Minister of Affordability and Utilities, and Parliamentary Secretary Chantal de Young, to announce the end of the Alberta Utility Commission's pause on approvals tomorrow and the direction Alberta will take to ensure that we have affordable and reliable electricity. Alberta is Canada's leader in renewable energy. In fact, as much as 92% of the renewables investment that happened in Canada in 2023 happened in Alberta. Our unique deregulated electricity market and competitive tax system mean that we are Canada's hub for investment. And we want our province to remain uh, the jurisdiction of choice for investors. But growing our renewable energy industry must happen in well-defined and responsible ways. That wasn't happening, which is why in August we implemented a pause to large utility-scale uh, renewable electricity projects using wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, or biogas. We instituted the pause for one simple reason. We needed an affordable and reliable grid. The emergency alert we had during that bitter, bitterly cold weekend in January showed us the importance of such. At the same time, we needed to place Albertans first. We need to ensure that we're not sacrificing our future agricultural yields or tourism dollars or breathtaking viewscapes to rush renewables developments through. And I will keep Albertans at the forefront of our policy. When we first instituted this pause, the AUC had 13 applications ready for review. During the pause, that number doubled to 26, and I expect this trend will continue. But we must be responsible when it comes to approving applications. Renewables have a place in our energy mix, but the fact remains that they are intermittent and unreliable. They are not the silver bullet for Alberta's electricity needs, and they are not the silver bullet of electricity affordability, because each new development risks driving up the transmission costs and makes Alberta's utility bills even more expensive. So we've been doing the work to to ensure that we have clear rules for the regulator, investors, municipalities, and Alberta landowners. And having clear rules means that everyone knows we will prioritize our agricultural lands. That means the AUC will take an agriculture-first approach when evaluating the best use of agricultural lands proposed for renewable development. Alberta will no longer permit renewable generation development on Class 1 and Class 2 lands unless the proponent can demonstrate the ability for both crops and or livestock to coexist with the renewable generation project. Our government will establish the tools necessary to ensure Alberta's native grasslands, irrigable and productive lands continue to be available for agricultural production. Protecting Alberta's land is also why we will establish buffer zones of a minimum of 35 kilometers around protected areas and other pristine viewscapes as designated by the province. New wind projects will no longer be permitted within those buffer zones and other proposed developments loco uh, located within the buffer zones may be subject to a visual impact assessment before approval. Albertans have been vocal that they don't want large-scale developments to interfere with our province's most beautiful natural features. You cannot build wind turbines the size of the Calgary Tower in front of a UNESCO World Heritage Site or on Nose Hill or in your neighbor's backyard. We have a duty to protect the natural beauty and communities of our province. And that includes reclamation, which is why developers will be responsible for reclamation costs via bond or security. The reclamation costs will either be provided directly to the Alberta government or may be negotiated with landowners if sufficient evidence is provided to the AUC, such as money being set aside and held in trust. It is critical that we do not repeat errors of the past and that we have reclamation rules and costs accounted for at the beginning of any development. Another duty that we have and that we will honour is the duty to consult with First Nations. Meaningful engagement will be required before any policy changes for projects on Crown land and those changes would not come into effect until late 2025. Any development of renewable development on Crown lands will be on a case-by-case -case basis. We're also giving municipalities a voice by automatically granting them the right to participate in AUC hearings and allowing them to review rules related to municipal submission requirements while clarifying consultation requirements. In addition, we will enable municipalities to be eligible to request cost recovery for participation and review. And finally, we're addressing the mess that the former NDP government left behind. When they rushed their plans for a coal phase out, they neglected to change the corresponding transmission policy. That was irresponsible, and we've been consulting with industry for years on how to correct it. 
Changes to Alberta's transmission regulation are expected in the coming months as the engagement process continues and renewable pro uh, projects should expect changes in how transmission costs are allocated. Our work is not yet done, but I want to thank everyone at the AUC for handling the challenges and the opportunities of renewables thoroughly and thoughtfully. We asked for a lot from them and they responded. And now I will turn it over to Minister Nathan Newdor for additional details about what happens next. Thank you, Premier. Good morning. As Premier Smith mentioned, our goal is to ensure that Alberta's electricity grid is reliable, affordable, and sustainable for future generations to come. In fact, I was tasked with this in my mandate letter from the Premier. As a Minister of Affordability and, and Utilities, I regularly hear from Albertans about how expensive their utility bills have gotten. It's not uncommon for my constituents to actually bring me their bills. I've also heard that many concerns surrounding our grid's reliability, much like the Premier mentioned, was highlighted during the last month's cold snap and the subsequent emergency alert. Listening to Albertans is our government's top priority. To address these concerns, we, need, we knew we needed a balanced and thoughtful approach that considered all perspectives to protect the affordability and reliability of our electricity grid. These perspectives are more easily understood with a brief review of history. When the NDP threw open the gates for renewable energy development, our province became a free-for-all, completely lacking sufficient rules or guidelines. Our province has been and continues to be a destination of choice for investment, not only thanks to our competitive tax, tax system and unique energy-only market, but largely in part to our government's commitment to reducing economic barriers. However, the rapid pace of this unrestricted growth raised concerns that needed to be addressed. As a responsible government, we will not kick that can down the road for someone else to deal with. We needed to make sure that we put Albertans first. This is why we directed the AUC to implement a brief pause on approvals while they conducted an inquiry into renewable energy development. Over the past seven months, I have personally met with many renewable developers and heard perspectives from countless Albertans. At the same time, the AUC conducted rigorous consultation between August and December, which included three open houses and over 600 pages of written and oral submissions. I want to thank everyone who took the time to give us their input. We are committed to continuing to listen to Albertans on this issue, and your feedback has been integral to this process. I have since received and thoroughly reviewed the first of the AUC's two reports, and would like to thank the staff of the AUC who worked tirelessly to complete it. With a pause listening tomorrow, I sent the AUC a letter this morning to provide policy guidance going forward, based upon the findings of their first report. As the Premier mentioned, by the end of 2024, our government intends to bring forward the necessary policy, legislative and regulatory changes required to set a clear and responsible path forward for renewable project development. In addition to those changes, the AUC has made several commitments going forward. The AUC will take an agriculture-first approach when evaluating project proposals on agricultural land. Agriculture is at the heart of Alberta playing a significant role in our heritage, economy, and our way of life. Our native grasslands are something that farmers and ranchers have conserved since before we became a province and are deeply connected to Alberta's First Nations. These, along with Alberta's vast irrigation networks and other agricultural lands, play an in invaluable role in putting affordable, high-quality food on tables around the world. To support the agriculture-first approach, we will begin taking steps to make sure that the value and importance of agricultural land is taken into account when developing new renewable projects. Let me be clear, there will be no blanket bans on specific types of land. Instead, we are being responsible by ensuring that renewable energy projects do not sterilize agricultural lands. That's why proponents must demonstrate that agriculture, both crops and livestock, are able to coexist with developments on LSRS Class 1 and Class 2 lands. As the Premier stated, we have a duty to protect the natural beauty and land of our province, ensuring that Alberta's best qualities can be enjoyed for generations to come. We've learned from Alberta's past, which is why we want to make sure that we get it right for the first time with renewable energy development. Going forward, developers will be responsible for reclamation costs via a bond or security protecting landowners' rights. This bond will be provided directly to the government of Alberta or may be negotiated with the landowner if sufficient evidence is provided to the AUC. As the Premier said earlier, the government will also be designating buffer zones of a minimum of 35 kilometres around protected areas and other pristine viewscapes. 
There is no universal definition of a pristine viewscape. However, many use that term to refer to areas that are unobstructed natural landscapes. New wind projects will no longer be permitted within these zones due to their vertical footprint. And other types of developments may be subject to a visual impact assessment before approval. The AUC will conduct hearings to determine appropriate setbacks for projects from neighboring residences and other important infrastructure, as well as they will be required to conduct site visits for proposed projects. Additionally, the AUC has also committed to enhancing the existing visual impact assessment requirements. To be clear, these changes will not be retroactive. They will apply to project approvals starting March 1st of this year. Similar protections have been successfully used in jurisdictions around the world. Moving on to Crown Lands, the inquiry showed that continued meaningful engagement will be required before any policy changes are made for projects on Crown Land, which would not come into effect until the end of next year. This meaningful engagement includes consulting with First Nations, as the Premier mentioned, as well as other important stakeholders. In the meantime, any developments on Crown Lands will be on a case-by-case -case basis. We are also directing the AUC to automatically grant municipalities the right to participate in hearings. One of the barriers many municipalities faced previously was participation with participation was the financial burden, which they will now be eligible to request cost recovery for. Municipalities will be able to review the rules related to their submission requirements, while the AUC has committed to clarifying their consultation requirements. This will make the process more clear and transparent. In conclusion, the last two years, for the last two years, our government has worked with key advocates to explore how we can reduce one of the largest expenses on Albertans' utility bills, which are transmission fees. Our engagement process on transmission regulations is continuing, and changes are expected in the coming months. All energy projects should expect these changes to touch on how transmission costs are allocated. As the Premier spoke to, we are proud that Alberta continues to be a global leader in responsible energy development and leads our country in renewable energy. Providing investors with certainty and clarity is non-negotiable for our government. That is why we implemented the pause on approvals just under seven months ago, and we set clearly defined start and end dates, limiting the duration of the pause as much as possible. Construction of previously approved projects continued uninterrupted. Existing renewable infrastructure was unaffected, and the AUC continued to receive 13 additional project applications, meaning there are now 26 new renewable energy projects pending approval. Even more, reports have shown that the pause had no impact on the growth of numbers for Alberta's renewable sector in 2023. In fact, Alberta accounted for more than 92% of Canada's overall growth in renewable energy and energy storage capacity last year. Today, we're setting a clear path for renewable energy in the province moving forward. These changes will only continue to strengthen investor certainty and confidence in Alberta and provides clear expectations for both agriculture and energy stakeholders. By providing investors with clear long-term expectations, they can confidently commit to reaping the rewards of investing in Alberta. As I said in my letter to the AUC, these changes will help lay the foundation for a more affordable, reliable, and sustainable electricity system for all Albertans today and into the future. While we have much work to do, we will continue listening to Albertans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, again, the media Q&A portion of the announcement. A uh, reminder to everyone here in the room and on the lines to state your name and outlet, and you will have one question, one follow-up. If I could get a show of hands for those in the room. Gotcha. We'll go back to Radio Canada, then to Graham next. Um, Mark Antoine Hollande, Radio Canada. My first question is, how many projects will be affected by, by this? Um, have, you, have you measured that? Uh, we are aware of 26 projects before the AUC, so obviously those will be impacted. It is uh, very difficult to uh, count which projects may or may not come forward, um, but all future projects after March 1st will be under the new policy guidelines. And are you not afraid that such regulations will have an impact on you know, investments or jobs that maybe companies that will need to come to Alberta will not go to Manitoba or Saskatchewan, for example? Well, Manitoba just uh, ruled out the possibility of renewables projects proceeding in the province for the time being. And uh, we think that uh, a responsibility to protect agricultural land will provide certainty investors. <coughs> if they make other investment decisions, that is uh, up to them and, and their investors. Yeah, I have a question, um, I'll guess for either of you. Um, lifting moratorium, is it really lifted? Like, can they go ahead? Because you mentioned, Premier, there's more work to be done. 
You've mentioned that clarity doesn't really come into effect for the Crown land until later. So it's lifted. What does that mean? Can the companies then, the applications are now moving ahead? But it seems the rules aren't all there yet. Uh, they are all moving ahead. And they all moved ahead through the last six months as well. There is only a pause on final approval. So many of them will be uh, addressed imminently by the AEC that is under their jurisdiction. Um, and any projects perhaps on Crown land will also proceed on a case by case basis. And if there is a duty of consultation with First Nations that will have to proceed, which would have had to happen otherwise. Um, so I think, I, I think they're all uh, expected to move forward at pace. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, just the the, the thing is, um, you don't get a guaranteed yes in any approval process. And so this will be the new lens that they look at. And perhaps some of the projects will modify to make sure they're on marginal lands to locate closer to transmission lines uh, to make sure that uh, they're not interfering with vistas. So there is an opportunity now that everyone knows what our expectation is for the regulator to look at the siting and to put it through that lens. And then if there's modifications needed, then then that will occur. There's also an opportunity for municipalities to um, to, to come in and and, um, and put their support or opposition to it. I mean, there are many municipalities that, that are in favor of wanting more of this development. So having that additional voice will have to be part of the process as well. Follow-up. Then, Premier, what about your comments regarding the one-for-one? One? In other words, we really can't move ahead with renewables unless we have natural gas power plants. We, we certainly need both. I mean, as we're looking... How does that look into this? Like, can you, can you Not, improve? a um, renewable plant without having a natural gas plant to um, as a safety net? Well, it, it takes some time once an approval happens to get the equipment, start the, the process. So we would um, be able to have a parallel process to make sure we're bringing on uh, an equivalent amount of baseload power to match our needs. I mean, the good news is we've got 2,700 megawatts of natural gas coming on. Um, we've so, we saw on January 13th that our peak use at the moment is about 12,343 megawatts, bringing 2,700 new megawatts of natural gas based load dispatchable power on, gives us a little bit of wiggle room. And we just have to make sure that as we grow, and I think my minister has suggested that we're going to need to double our base load energy need by 2050, we have to make sure that we're pacing and bringing on renewables and base load power at the same time. Sorry, and it's the case of then you have to have the natural gas first in place before you approve any more renewables? We have to have dispatchable, reliable power in place to meet what we think will be our, our peak power, definitely. Because I think we saw what happened on January the 13th, 5 o'clock at night, there was zero solar and there was 7 megawatts of wind of 6,000 installed megawatts. So we have to plan for the worst case scenario and do our projections about what we think our electricity demand is going to be and then make sure we're bringing on um, a, enough dispatchable power to be able to meet that. And I think that we have some, some room. I don't know how long it will take us before we end up constrained. Maybe the minister can respond to that. But we're, we're very pleased to see that over the, in March, some, um, between March and, and June, we're going to see the lion's share of that come on. And so that does give us a little bit of additional, um, additional room. Yeah, thank you, Premier. So just to clarify, under the AUC report and, and um, policy direction, there is no requirement for any of these proponents to add natural gas to their approvals. That is, is totally separate. The, the inquiries that we set forward for the ISO and the MSA will speak to that uh, reliability piece in the coming months. Thank you. And a show of hands again. Um, we'll go to you, Matt, and then Shay. Sure. Uh, those in the industry, the renewable industry, were saying they hope to have fairness in this announcement today. Is that what they got and, and why? Uh, I absolutely believe that they did receive fairness. Uh, I think it was also, also to be noted that agriculture was hoping for uh, representation and their voices to be heard, as well as municipalities and, and even other stakeholders like the tourism industry was uh, imminently concerned about potential impacts to their uh, tourist landscape. So we have sought to find the balance of all of those. And I think uh, the policy direction that we've put forward does find that balance. Uh, renewable energy and agricultural land can coexist, and our pristine viewscapes and tourist destinations can also exist with, with um, renewables if, if they're aware of how that may or may not impact uh, the viewscape. You mentioned pristine 
views, pristine landscapes there? Like, that's a pretty arbitrary term. Like, how do you, what's the definition for that and who decides? Sure, there, there is no universal definition for that. Uh, our government will continue to work on policy with other ministries, particularly environment protected areas and forestry, um, and what's the other and Forestry and, and parks. Forestry and parks, uh, obviously, and tourism and, uh, may, have, may have some contribution to that as well. Right now, it is generally accepted that in our prairies, if we look to the west, our foothills and the majestic Rocky Mountains are uh, fairly significant in that. And those park boundaries will be the, the beginning points of, of that conversation. Thanks, Matt. And Shay? Yeah, just looking for some additional clarity on that definition of viewscapes. My understanding is if you were to apply the 35 kilometer buffer um, to those protected areas, um, that could actually place a significant de facto ban on all of southern Alberta for these projects. I, I guess what, what is your response to that concern? Well, I think the, the province is much wider than 35 kilometers. We go all the way to Saskatchewan. I think there's many locations there. Um, and I think. Uh, Again, significant stakeholders and tourism industry in particular have spoken to how valuable uh, those viewscapes are. And that, that number is not arbitrary. Again, there have been many jurisdictions around the world, the UK, BC, uh, and a number in the US that have determined that uh, visual impacts can be impacted beginning at 20 kilometers and, and move out to 35. And we have decided that in our case with the flat prairies leading to those foothills, that 35 is the most appropriate. And uh, we will we'll proceed on that, that understanding. Um, and just some clarity on the issue of reclamation, when will the bond and security need to be posted? I'm just hearing from some that will say that if it's needed on the front end, that could pose a barrier um, instead of once the project is underway. We're very well aware of that. And uh, we are looking at a number of different um, potential possibilities. First, we're seeking to find the, the best uh, evaluation and the extent of any reclamation. And then we will we'll work with industry on, on how they would present that and pay that forward and what security and whether it's an interest bearing account and all of those kind of considerations, we will continue to work with industry on resolving that as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And Janet? Yeah, just touching on that again, how would that bond uh, and upfront investment compare to what's required for liability management for oil and gas? Well, I think the only way they can compare is, is by principle and, and the policy, not by evaluation. I think the, the projects are radically different in cost and uh, the potential impact on environment are also different in nature. Uh, there, is, there is no oil or gas uh, products in renewables, so that's not the factor. We, we do know that uh, many footings for wind turbines in particular can be 30, 30 feet down. Uh, so we are working with industry and third-party representatives to find out what should be established in, in removal. Sorry, I think you misunderstood my question, or I didn't phrase it well. What kind of upfront investment um, proportionally would be required? Would it be the same kind of bond or security required? Yeah, that? yeah, let the Premier speak to that. One of the things, look, um, obviously there were errors made in the past on how to address the issue of future liability for oil and gas. So you don't correct that problem by compounding it when you have a, a new opportunity to create a, an approach that perhaps the oil and gas industry should have had from the beginning. I've been a, I was a landowner advocate going back to 1997, so I've given quite a bit of thought to how to protect landowner rights. And it, it seems to me that on a go forward, if you're putting aside a little bit each year and it's growing with interest by end of life, you should have enough money set aside in order to reclaim it so that if that property transfers, then a pot of money goes along with it. So that's um, the kind of approach that they take in the nuclear industry. They take it in the uh, forestry industry. They take it in mining. It's called an environmental income trust. But we have not, uh, I, I gather that we, um, that the federal government at some point changed that structure for, for oil and gas. And that's the kind of approach that we're thinking of taking here. We have to do a bit more consultation on it. But um, I'm very much interested in seeing the liability follow the asset so that at end of life there's money there to be able to clean it up and the landowner isn't left holding uh, the bag on it. The approach in the oil and gas industry has been different because there's a shared liability that happens in the sector through the Orphan Well Fund. The industry as a whole and the government agreed in the past that anyone who defaults on inactive wells goes into the Orphan Well Fund and the industry as a whole pays in levies in order to be able to reclaim that. Uh, we also created a new model that came into place last year of required spend on reclamation. So it's set at $700 million per year. There was a billion dollars, shy of a couple hundred million, that the federal government assisted in site rehabilitation during COVID. 
um, th that we're entering into, I believe, our third year of doing uh, liability reclamation. So we have to take a different approach because we have an estimated $30 billion liability. But I would say that the model that we're putting forward today is, 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 would be the preferred model for how we, how we deal with, uh, with reclamation costs. So speaking of landowner rights, I mean, landowners in some cases can't say no to oil and gas infrastructure, but how do you explain to them that they can't say yes without caveats to renewable infrastructure? Well, I, I think we know in rural Alberta, you don't have carte blanche to use your land in whichever way you want. I mean, they have rules around uh, home quarter. They have rules around spacing on well sites for oil and gas development. And so th this just seems to me to also be something that we have to be a little more deliberate about. I mean, we've heard stories, for instance, on on wind turbines, and I think I may have mentioned this before, um, one being built too close to the Oyen airport. So it required us to change the airport so we could get medevac flights in and out. I also hear from landowners in my own riding that a landowner is now impacted and impaired from being able to do spraying because the turbines were built too close to her property. So we have to be mindful that you can't use your property in a way that impacts another's property. And we also have to be mindful that we're managing it for other uses. It's, it's not unusual for us to, to have spacing requirements and, and other provisions for how intense agriculture land is used. Thank you, Janet. We just have time for two more questions here, so we're going to head over to the phones. Operator, could you put through our first caller, please? Emma Greeny, Global Mail. Yeah, okay. Um, this question is for either one who wants to uh, to answer it. But when you're talking about the pristine use gates and these 35 kilometer buffers, um, when will we see that list of starters? But also, will that be applied to other natural resources such as logging, coal? oil and gas, and in fact, these new gas plants that Premier, you mentioned that Alberta needs very badly. Uh, so this will begin March 1st and will apply to the vertical footprint of wind turbines. Other projects of, of all kinds uh, could trigger a visual assessment need if they're within that, that spacing. Uh, one example I'd like to use, anything on the ridge uh, is far more visible than if it might be in a, a valley or behind a bluff. So that is what we've asked the AUC to determine with site site visits so that they can more accurately determine that visual impact. All right, um, I didn't quite get an answer there. So will it apply to logging coal and oil and gas? Uh, that is a potential. It's up to those regulators and those industries to determine that. And was there a follow up, Emma? Yeah, sure. Um, any more information you can give there would be good. But when it comes to the security bonds, um, and paying that money, will that, it says you're going to want it to be paid to government. So where will that fund be held? Um, will it be a, a you know, developed at fund there? Will it be general revenues? Or what will that look like? We'll still have to do uh, additional work with the AUC and key stakeholders. Uh, and those are the, the nuanced questions that we are seeking to determine. We do know that if it's held either with a company or the landowner in the event of somebody's passing or uh, dissolution of the company, that has created problems in other industries. So there have been recommendations put forward by many, including municipalities, that it to be held with, uh, with the government so uh, it's accessible should any of those eventualities happen. But those decisions are not fully made and we continue to do that work. Thank you, Emma. And we'll take our last question. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Sean Holzer, Western Standard. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my call. Okay, so you said that these uh, policy changes are going to be uh, taking effect on March 1st. <coughs> what about uh, retroactive uh, to the um, infrastructure that's uh, already in place, given that 92% uh, of it apparently is in Alberta? Uh, it's, it's not retroactive. Uh, if there are policies or extreme circumstances that are, that are raised, we, we may look at that, but this is meant to apply March 1st going forward. I'm thinking more in terms of the uh, liabilities, the reclamation liabilities. Again, once we've, we've ascertained the, the actual evaluations of the securities put forward, which we've instructed the AUC to find out that uh, information in confidence, if we see a, a great disparity, we may address it on a case-by-case -case basis. But again, this is to apply on March 1st for projects going forward. And was there okay. a follow-up? Yeah, um, this policy seems uh, aimed uh, squarely at uh, you know agricultural land. W what about you know the urban landscapes? 
and um, the rooftop solar in the cities. Um, I was in California over uh, Christmas holidays, and uh, there's quite a few issues with um, you know consumers getting uh, into contracts for these uh, solar panels on their houses, and there's also um, potential for commercial uh, solar on top of uh, you know commercial buildings in downtown Calgary, or you know the premier has previously said that the West Edmonton Mall would be one of the biggest solar farms in the country. Um, how, is there any plans to come up with some kind of a policy to address uh, say the urban uh, potential? Absolutely, that is that will be coming forward in the continued work that we do. Uh, that would be captured on the umbrella statement of demand side management, which we are actively pursuing. We think there is a huge potential for Alberta to lead the country uh, on uh, reducing their consumption of electricity uh, in, on the load side. And uh, we look forward to bringing forth uh, more information in the coming days and weeks. Thank you, Sean. And that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you, everyone.